Okay. Action. Action. Yes. So, let everybody come back here. Just so everybody knows how to spell this. Hildegard Vaughn. It's the date 1,098 to 1,179. The monastic tradition. Okay, so we haven't had anybody really famous, right? The last person we did was Avencia Avicenna. I think is one of the most amazing people, but now we have this interesting person that shows up historically next, like the next master in a sense. Hildegard von Bingen. So Hildegard was her name. Von in German means from Bingen. So Hildegard from the town of Bingen. Okay, so she is a born in 1098. Um, she was born to a large family of 10 children who could not afford to feed her. So she was given to the monastery. This would be a uh, Benedictine, I believe, monastery. Yeah, Benedictine nun. She became a nun in the Benedictine Catholic tradition, age of eight. So... She started having visions. Oh, yes. Let's put her in place in time. So she's an important figure to me for a lot of reasons, but up until this time, we're in the dark ages of Europe, right? This is like the dark ages. Um, there's herbal medicine. The practice of medicine is horrific. All the activity we just talked about was in Persia at this time, right? So up until 1200 um, is when we have this, what's called the monastic tradition, because the only place that a lot of herbal medicine mm -hmm. lived was in the monasteries, right? But all the different Catholic sects and monasteries throughout Europe because all the books were in Greek and the only people that could speak and read Greek and Latin were monks and nuns. That's all the Bibles are written and Latin, like everything was done in Greek or Latin. So in a lot of monasteries are kind of like mini hospitals, retreats, nurturing, you know, their mission is to nurture the less fortunate, they're helping take care of people. But uh, every monastery, for the most part, or a lot of them, are going to have their own herbal gardens. Um, 1200 is the exact date almost the church formally decides to get out of the practice of medicine. This also correlates with the beginning of a whole change in Europe with the separation of church and state. It's setting the stage or bigger revolts, and a lot of revolutions and things like that. So before 1200, the church and monasteries would have been places where medicine was practiced. Okay. Um, but after 1200, the church formally decrees monasteries are now just a place of contemplation and medicine is going to be practiced outside of monasteries. Some things that might surprise people is up until this point, we're talking about Greek and Roman medicine. We're talking about the humors. We're talking about the elements, right? Astrology is very much a part of the system. Um, there is not the idea yet within the church that astrology is like a negative thing. That's like part of the whole medical system. So even Hildegard writing is like heavily influenced a lot by astrology. 
you know, see something really interesting. Her, so Hildegard also did a lot of paintings. This is my all time favorite. I think I showed this to you last week. To me, this is her medicine wheel, right? That's, that's, a, that's a medicine wheel, Mondo. I mean, the, it's the exact same color almost as the prairie natives medicine wheel. All the direct, yeah, this is one of her many paintings. So very cool. But it's rich in astrology, symbology, and that, because that would have been one of the languages that she spoke through. So that's an important point. It's kind of interesting because this does. Um, also, during this time, by the way, you probably, there's a long history of people being accused if you were practicing herbal medicine, you were often accused of being like a witch, where you would have been punished or burned or had some kind of thing, because the practice of medicine had not yet really, there wasn't like a profession of doctors and schools and guilds and everything it would have been all through like what we would call like the oral tradition mostly so the it's amazing that herbal medicine stayed alive like all the villages and people pass down stuff to their families and that but it, it was a really it really was the dark ages in a lot of ways in europe just you know art wasn't really like a huge thing during this time Everybody knows the context, kind of, because that's important. Okay, so this is also a time of a lot of plagues, a lot of plagues, a lot of people dying big time. A lot of herbal medicine authorities were all organized by the clergy. Um, for a lot of different reasons. Every, a lot of monasteries had herbal apothecaries, herbal gardens. A lot of these are still in existence. Uh, a lot of times when people go to like Italy and Eastern Europe, they'll send me a picture of a monastery and like they're, they're actually, one of them in Italy has an intact astrology herb garden still that's never stopped being produced. It's like 12 spokes of a wheel. I've got a picture of it somewhere. It's very cool. But it goes back to like the 800s. It's always been maintained. It's like a little medicine wheel. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Hildegard started having visions at the age of three. At the age of seven, she just blatantly said the angels brought her their own system of medicine. And she said she could interpret and understand angels directly. So all of her, she did music, she did poetry, she did medicine. She had zero training in any of them, by the way. Just like somebody just took a blank piece of paper and wrote a system of medicine, largely based on Greek and Roman system, but she was never really studied or trained in it. Everything she wrote was, she said, directly from divine source. Okay. Um, she also practiced medicine freely. People would send her questions from all over the known world at this time, and people would come from all over. Um, people would ask her questions. Okay. Um, she was becoming very famous for her visions and prophecies. Um, if there's a important backstory here a lot of like regional bishops that were men started to get very upset and jealous of her so there was a huge effort by a lot of northern european bishops to try to get her kind of kicked out of the church but actually through the span of four different popes four different popes supported her um, and she was actually eventually canonized, uh, like in the Catholic Church, she's what they call a doctor, doctor of the church. So September 17th is her actual, uh, in the church, her feast day. 2012, she was canonized. Um, but if you read her writings, 
you're going to be like, okay, this is not super <laughs> churchy because there's a lot of astrology, a lot of elements writing about the elements. But what she wrote, considering she knew nothing, she was not a musician. She wrote, she composed music. She never didn't know how to do that. She was not an artist, but she had this art that came through her. So that picture I showed you is one of her divine pieces of artwork. Um, she has a bunch of. Um, to further kind of blister a wound, so to speak, she was probably one of the first, and she's known for this in feminist studies, she was one of the first people who blatantly came out for women's rights at a time where there were really none. So you can imagine when the Pope eventually gave her her own monastery, that was like, there's a really cool documentary movie you can watch about this, like she that <laughs> for her blistered a lot of wounds too. Mm -hmm. So so even though she was protected by all the popes who supported her and encouraged her, there was just a lot of jealousy even within the church directed towards her. So she wrote nine books, 72 songs, and 70 poems. The main book, that we're interested in is just now called the Physica, which is her herbal medicine and healing textbook of Physica. By the way, her music, she said, is all channeled through the uh, angels. She also has a bunch of, some of her other books talk about um, psychology as a basis for illness. This is the first time in the West that this has ever been written in history. And Remember, Avencia was starting to talk about that, but now she's the first person in the Western world who's talking about this. Um, she had a lot of prophetic visions. The church like, has published all these. They're all available and out there. Um, so there's a book called... Uh, I just... I don't, I don't know how to pronounce this. Give us... S-C-I-V-A. These are all free online, by the way. Skivus. I don't know how to say that in Latin. Uh, has all 26 of her visions in detail. Some of them are apocalyptic, kind of like the book of Revelation is apocalyptic. Um, she was also fought very hard for women's rights within the church, but also just in the community and world in general. She actually is the first person to scientifically write about a lot of scientific things. Like she wrote that hand washing after going to the bathroom is important. No one ever made a connection that that would be good for, there was no idea of sanitation at this time. That's one of the scientific things she's most known for is that she was the first Western person to write about this. Okay. Um, a lot of people today are still deeply involved in her teachings. This would be people from like a healing background, a lot of people with a different um, religious background follow her and her teachings. Um, she's just kind of known in the herbal medicine world. She's referenced all the time. Um, they often call her a medical revolutionary. One thing that she did that got her kind of like a lot of negative attention in the church was the, the what's the... Uh, Self's kind of like scarification practice mm -hmm. in the church. Mm -hmm. We have the things the that create the, the bonding. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was very outspoken that this is not a good practice because it was, you know, hurting people, uh, which got her, you know, the bishops and some of the people do not like that too. That's written, I've read that in some of the Catholic writings about her. Mm -hmm. So she has a lot of theories. Let's just touch on a couple. One of the coolest ones is she introduced this concept of viridas. It's really cool. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Oh, 
Usually we just call it Viridas. I don't know why all those extra Latin letters are in there. But Viridas is what she called the green power. So in the wisdom that was revealed to her that there is, but what we say in herbal medicine, there is a hidden life force within everything that's alive. And she said everything was alive. Plants had like a vital life force, which would have been different right than later medical ideas that crystals had a life force so she recommends a lot of crystals mm -hmm. she recommends every food has a life force this greening power of nature this ability of nature to heal and that there's this ability to regenerate and heal anything and that this is like a life force that runs through the human body too so she's talking about energy here right life force she also said that this life force is most deeply affected by lack of faith or loss of faith. Um, that yes, diet and stress and emotions and all these other things affected it. But the biggest like thing that affected it would be like a loss of faith or we would probably translate that as just a loss of spiritual connection maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, just to mm -hmm. emphasize, she did practice literally astrology and talked a lot about the astrological influences, crystals, plants, foods, all kinds of stuff, different types of water. Um, her writings have like a pretty detailed recipes for um, the beneficial use of eating different foods, diet therapy, diet, diet recipes, herbal medicines, crystals. Again, another unique thing she kind of proposed to the Western world, I guess this was in Greek medicine, was that prevention is the best treatment for any disease. Prevention is the best way to treat anything. Again, this is where we get some of our cleansing traditions she advocated a two-week fasting and cleansing period every year at least once, but preferably four times a year for every season. Um, she talked a lot about avoiding stress, the importance of managing your emotions and anger. Um, similar to Chinese medicine, she also felt that this viridas, this life force of the body, has to be healed before any healing can happen. Very similar. So this is the vitalist tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Here we're talking about the vitalist tradition that we follow. Good. Okay, and she also introduces this idea, like in Chinese medicine, that no food is good for every single person. Everybody's unique. Everybody needs different foods based on what their problems are. The only foods that she felt everybody should eat were these three. Spelt, was her healing grain. Chestnuts, major healing remedy we never use anymore hardly and fennel seed. So her most famous recipe is spelt fennel cookies. Obviously, there's no sugar back then, so there wasn't sugar in them. These are just flour and fennel, maybe some chestnuts in them. Okay. She also said moderation of diet and no extremes. You should not eat a lot of raw food. You shouldn't eat only vegan. You shouldn't eat only meat. Like she had a very moderated approach to making diet recommendations. Okay. Um, she said the four element imbalances cause every all 24 diseases. 
and these 24 diseases cause all of humanity's diseases. She has some really unique writings about kind of like biblical characters and things. There's some really fascinating stuff she wrote that we don't have time to go over. Um, like she has this really interesting writing about like Adam and Eve and like gets into the organs of them and what happened when all this happened. It's like really like kind of fascinating to even think what, what she's writing about. Um, she said that her music was to heal people. So a lot of people do actually study her music for music therapy and healing. You can YouTube it. It's all free. You can get all of her music for free. She actually is the first person to talk about the three body types. Ectoderm, like the thin vata type, right? Mm -hmm. The endoderm, the kapha type, and the mesoderm, like the pitta type, you know, the more muscular type. And she also thought that each of those correlated to a different, there was three levels of the body. The different diseases happen in different levels. It's pretty cool. Um, but a lot of really cool remedies. A lot of cool remedies. Uh, I'll just start throwing some out real quick. Mm -hmm. So for eye diseases, sapphire water. You soak a bit of sapphire and water overnight. She did a lot of gem waters, and you actually rinse the eye with that every day. Yeah. Uh, obviously, fennel rinse for the eye, which we still do today. Um, she actually had people put fennel into dough, like spelt dough, and just put it on the eye, like a just fennel dough ball. <laughs> yeah. Ear diseases would be um, grape vine water. Um. Internally, we would take oregano and galangal, which is like a, a type of ginger that would be used more in Europe. Uh, also, topaz is the best crystal for ear problems. Uh, even before we knew about calcium, she said the best remedy for weak teeth was eating salmon bones, which is pretty wise, right? This is before we knew anything about minerals. So, I mean, everything she said is actually, there's, I've read a ton of her writings. I've never, anything medical or herbal she ever wrote, it actually, like it's all used today still. It's very fascinating. For someone that had no training whatsoever, it's really quite amazing. Colds and flus, she talked about not doing dairy. That's really mucus forming, right? And whorehound was like her main flu remedy. Uh, we'll talk about some of her remedies next week. Um, she talked about the importance of the bowels. Talked about, just like in Chinese medicine, no cold food, no cold drinks. Breakfast should always be warm. Breakfast should always be grains with a little bit of fruit or nuts. Talked about breathing exercises. Um... We'll have to go over some of her remedies because we're running out of time. So, yeah, she has this really best thing, yeah, like right up about Adam and the fall from grace and how that has affected like humanity's liver forever. And mm -hmm. like a lot of her liver remedies, she the way she talks about them, it's like she's saying they were like fix humanity almost, you know, like if all of humanity would treat their liver like. Well, it's probably true. We'd be a much better place. Um, she has some very Chinese, like, right? This is one of her quotes that I found. So it's just like I have a Chinese textbook. textbook. This is one of her direct quotes. If the human soul feels that its body is menaced, then the heart, the liver, and the vessels will constrict. Hereby, a sort of cloudiness. Remember how we talked about the phlegm in the heart in Chinese medicine? Hereby, a sort of cloudiness will rise from the heart and envelop the heart in darkness. 
This is how humans become sad. That's kind of like that Chinese idea we talked about how energy can get stuck and emotions can just build up inside of us and create this almost like a cloud over our organs. Yeah. So rheumatism. All right, she talked about <laughs> alcohol and right. gout and all those things. Um, you want to know her secret remedy for arthritis? Yes. Is gold spell cookies, like a little bit of gold powder. The spell. But also celery seed. Uh, she had actually over 100 in her book. There's over 100 arthritis remedies, herbal remedies. That's just like a fun. Oh, here's one you might know. Why you might want to know? Uh, deer fat is the best fat for salves for joint problems. Elm wood is the best fire you would use to warm your cold joints. And, you know, this would be at a time before mm -hmm. indoor heating. So, like when we, I mean, we were cold, we were cold. Yeah. Um, badger fat as the best fat for mixing joint salves. There's all these really quirky, bizarre things. Her best, uh, one of her best food remedies for arthritis is veal, bone, and knuckle broth, basically collagen, right? Which we know is great for arthritis. Uh, she did a lot of saunas. She has a lot of writing on cancer. She has this crazy cancer recipe that I've always wanted to make, but there's one ingredient that's bizarre that I can't get. You want to know what that ingredient is? It's this herbal formula. It's basically duckweed, which is an herb, cinnamon, sage, ginger, fennel, rue, white pepper, ornamental, field mustard, burdock, and cleavers. But there's one secret ingredient that's a vulture's beak. Wow, yeah. you should, you should <laughs> oh my which God. is very similar to Chinese medicine uses uh -huh. that in a lot of tumor type forms. Yeah, vultures. That's the thing that I think it's like illegal. It's probably illegal to possess. So well, with all the bird flu going around, you'll try to find a lot of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but her breast cancer, she talks about, like we still do today, like violet leaf salve for breast tumors and breast cancers. Um, but she does recommend uh, a period of fasting for every person. And fasting and cleansing is important for renewing those forces of regeneration. And also, she said, psychological cleansing and spiritual power. So she saw fasting and cleansing as really a treatment for almost every disease. And that would be two weeks was how long you would do this for. Um, and this would be a fast where you would still have juices, like soup, broths, and teas. You'd be getting some fulfillment. It's not like a total water fast. Yeah. Yarrow as a major wound treatment. Um, just goes on and on. So I have this fascinating. Um, really big on apples, cherries, currants, dates, raspberries. Um, could go on. I have just like pages and pages of stuff where. The only book that you ever want to read of hers, I mean, a lot of them are free online because they have been translated, but uh, is the one called Hildegard of Bingen's Medicine. That's the best English version one. That's the one I have here at the office. It's called Hildegard of Bingen's Medicine. Published by some people from Germany, uh, spent their whole life who are doctors. They're all doc and they actually use her work in their practice. Um, who have actually painstakingly translated from German all of her, like the essence of her writing. So, but you can go to Half Price Books and buy her Physica that's just been translated roughly for like a dollar. I recommend everybody have a copy. It's interesting reading for sure. Okay, all kinds of stuff. 
memory loss, nettle oil rubbed into the temples before bed, just like all kinds of cool stuff. Favorite liver remedy was hyssop. That's like a little different. We don't use it so much for that now. She also has like, she sets her diet up in stages, like first, second, third, depending like if people are getting better or not. But in general, spelt is always the answer. Spelt, spelt, spelt. Every time I read her stuff, I try to start eating spelt and cranberry. I still can't do it. Okay, let's call it good for now. Uh, questions on her? She has like a documentary you can watch on Netflix for free, but it's more, um, it's done by like a Catholic group. So it's more of like a, more of just like her as like a, a nun in that tradition. It doesn't really get into like all of her herbal medicine kind of writings and that. Just like her struggles and some of that. Yeah, she was like a true empowerment person. But pretty fascinating. I mean, I'll play her music here as we're leaving. I mean, she's not doing this, it's her <laughs> recomposed. But it's all like a Benedictine kind of chance. But her monastery is still there. I know a lot of people that have been there or go there. Cool. Yeah, it's really cool. It's kind of like a Edgar Casey, but to me, like way more of like a whole system of medicine. You know, Edgar Casey just had a ton of remedies and things, but not this is like a whole system, you know, that she did. If you want to know Edgar Casey's last, um, Edgar Casey's last prophecy. Do you ever know that one? Yeah. His last uh, prophecy is that he would someday be reincarnated in Nebraska. What? Yeah, that was his. He won't come back and he'll eventually come back and he'd be in Nebraska. That was his last prophecy. Wow. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me I don't believe it, but I looked it up. But it's in a way far date in the future, some crazy day. So check out her artwork this week. It's kind of really cool. She's got a bunch of different stuff. Her poems are, you know, I would say pretty religious type inspired. Mm -hmm. Yay, that was fun. Maybe for Hildegard, you could get that one. The, uh, it's called the... Uh, This that painting I showed you is called the Cosmic Tree. If you want to go through that, that would be the one for Hildegard at least to have. Cosmic Tree. Okay. 